Anderson. God Amen. Bless you. Amen. God bless Amen. you, Pastor Lois Antoine, and Prayer Changes Things Ministry in Southern California, and to each one of you that are on the line tonight. We are moving tonight into the second phase of the book of Revelations, chapter 4 and chapter 5. I want you to understand that what we're dealing with is the whole word of God, what the Bible is really all about in the Old and New Testament, all 66 books that God has declared for us to read and to study and to digest into our innermost being, which is the whole word of God. Again, I want to remind you that the Bible, capital B-I-B-L-E, stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. And while we're in the book of Revelations, I want to remind you that the blessings of the Lord is in this book. And it is found in chapter 1 and verse 3. And let me read that in your hearing. Revelations chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So the blessing of the Lord is upon us for the study of this word. And tonight, the Spirit of God has given us now Revelations chapter 4 and Revelations chapter 5. Just to give you a recap from last week, in this book of Revelations, we have three major sections. Three major sections. Number one, the things which thou hast seen. That is the Lord Jesus as the glorified one. The things which are the Lord Jesus head over the church, chapters 2 and 3. And the things which shall be hereafter, the Lord Jesus as the triumphant one who will conquer the whole world and rule heaven and earth. That is found in the book of Revelations, chapter 4, verse 1, to chapter 11, verse 18, chapter 11, verse 19, to chapter 16, verse 21, chapter 17, to verse 22. And so tonight, as we look now at the book of Revelations, chapter 4, we're now entering into one of the most glorious periods of time because we're entering into the throne room of the eternal and almighty God. I need you to understand tonight that this is one of the most glorious books that God has given us because it gives us now an insight. It gives us now a foresight. It gives us now a picture of the eternal and almighty God. Here in Revelations chapter 4 and chapter 5, we see the sovereignty of the creator God committed to the crucified and now enthroned lamb who is the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We find that this is from Revelations 4 chapter 1 to Revelations 5 chapter 14. Chapter 4 and 5 are pivoted, trying for us the risen Christ as Lord and who is given the exhortations to the churches that we gave you on last week between chapter 2 and chapter 3. And now to the judgment and the final triumph of the Lamb, chapter 6 through chapter 22. These chapters provide the historical and theological basis of the risen Lord's authority over both the church and the world by depicting his enthronement and power to carry out the judging and the saving purposes of God the Father. Chapter 4 asserts the sovereignty authority of God the Father as creator and ruler of this entire universe. And chapter 5 depicts the sovereign authority of God the Son as redeemer by creation and redemption. God is righteous in exercising authority over all things. In Revelation 5, it is a book of retribution, redemption, and restoration. This book, containing the remainder of the Revelation, chapter 6 through 22, is related to Ezekiel in his book of woes, Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. And let us look at that tonight, the book of Ezekiel, 
chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, so that you can understand that these books are companions and they are showing us the righteous word of God. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9, Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Verse number 10, Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mournings and woes. And so we see now that this corresponds with the word of God as found in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, now let's look also and move forward as we go into the word of God that also in the book of Daniel. Here we see in the book of Daniel that God also has him to seal up this book. And this is in chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, verses 4 and verses 9 and 10. And I want to read that for you tonight. Daniel 12 and 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. This is Daniel's chapter 4, uh, chapter 12, verse 4, and then we're going to look at 9 and 10. And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Verse 10, Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And so that is why tonight we are in the word of the living God, that we might get an understanding of the time, the seasons, and the changes that are coming forth in the power and the word of the living God. Therefore, again, let me refer that chapter 5 depicts the sovereign authority of God, the Son, as Redeemer. By creation and redemption, God is righteous in exercising authority over all things. In Revelation 5 is a book of retribution, redemption, and restoration. Again, this book containing the remainder of Revelations for chapter 6 through 22 is related to Ezekiel's book of woes, which I read to you, Ezekiel 2, 9 and 10, and the sealed book of Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, 9 and 10, which I just read. It gives us the crucified Lord as he is risen and now exalted the lion and the lamb of God, who is all powerful, all knowing, and present everywhere according to Revelation 5 and 6. And let me just read that to you, Revelation 5 and 6. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He and he alone, the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy to take the book and to open the seven seals. And when the lamb begins to break the seals, the climatic events of history begin to unfold. So let me read to you tonight, Revelations chapter four, beginning with verse one. And I need you to understand tonight that this is the word of the Lord for our future. And I need every one of you to realize that it is time for you to move forward in salvation. It is time for you to move forward in redemption. It is time for you to understand that all things now are moving toward this last and final day. And so because of that, you and I need to understand what Revelations 4 is all about. Let's begin with verse number one. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Verse number two. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. Verse number three. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sodded stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Verse number four, around the throne were 24 thrones and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes 
and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Verse number five, and from the throne proceeded lightning and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Verse number six, before the throne was like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Verse number seven, the first living creature was like a lion and the second living creature like a calf. The third living creature like the face of a man and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Verse number nine, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sit on the throne, who lives forever and forever. Verse number 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, verse number 11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. And so tonight as we enter into the fourth chapter of the book of Revelations. We're entering now into the heavenly atmosphere, and we're now moving into the realm of the almighty everlasting God. And so the translation and the transition of the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, taken us from Revelations chapter 1, verse 19. And I'm going to read that again. Revelations 1, 19. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. And so now we're moving f forward into this translation. The phrase after this in the Hebrew and the Greek is meta tata in ancient Greek. And it simply means now that we're moving into a new realm. Here, certainly this is making a point for beginning the third division of Revelations, when we find out what Revelations 1.19 said, one, the things which are, two, and the things which will take place after this. And so here we are now in chapter four, begins a heavenly perspective, looking down on the earth. The Bible was uh, has the most important references to heaven in passages such as Isaiah 6, one through eight, Ezekiel 1, and in passages describing the tabernacle, which symbolically describes heaven in the book of Exodus, chapter 25 through 32, chapter 35 through 40. In the description of heavenly things, John uses symbols. However, not everything is symbolic. As in parables of Jesus, many of the details are merely descriptive and they are not necessarily intended to carry a specific significance of their own. Listen to me tonight. Also, we should keep in mind the nature of symbolism. The symbol is always less than the reality. The reality of heaven is even greater than the description we have of it. Help us, Lord Jesus. It is a very little that we can know of the future state, but we may be quite sure that we may know as much as it is good for us. And that's why we're in Revelations chapter four tonight. We ought to be as content with that which is not revealed as that which is revealed. If God willed us not to know, we ought to be satisfied not to know. Depend on it. And he told us all about heaven and that is necessary to bring us there. And if he has revealed more, it would have served rather of the gratification of our curiosity and more less increase of grace. And so from Revelation 4 through Revelation 19, we have a section mainly concerned with God's judgment upon the world preceding Jesus' earthly reign for a thousand years. 
the period known as the Messianic Woes or the Great Tribulation. Tonight, I want you to understand that God's judgments are announced by a seven sealed scroll, seven trumpets, seven signs, seven bowls that poured out of God's wrath. And let me repeat that again. God's judgments are announced by a seven sealed scroll, seven trumpets, seven signs, and seven bowls that pour out of God's wrath. Revelations 4 introduces us to the place judgment comes from, and that is, my friends, God's throne in heaven. I want you to understand something tonight, that God is in control, and he rules this universe with power and might that proceeds from the very throne of the living God. And guess what? We are invited tonight, according to Revelations chapter 4, to the very throne of God. Here we see John enters heaven, and when John enters heaven, he brings us into that same period through this book called the book of Revelations. After things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Listen to me very carefully tonight. After these things, according to Revelations chapter 2 and 3, he spoke to the churches, and the seven churches comprehended all the churches of the ages, even to the one where we are now. After these things, John experienced the vision of heaven by moving up into that open door. And the Bible said, and the first voice which I heard, he said, the first voice that spoke in John in heaven, according to John 1 and 10, spoke to him again here. And that voice is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, this is not revelations. This is the revelation, the revealed word of the living God. And we understand tonight that it is Jesus Christ who is showing us now what is, what will be, and what must come to pass. Listen to me tonight, like a trumpet, the voice spoke loud and clear to John. It was like the trumpet that gathered the congregation of Israel together or gathered an army for battle. Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. John will be shown things that concern the future, which must take place after this, not in John's present day on the Isle of Patmos where he was exiled by the emperor of Rome. Listen to me, I need you to understand today, like a trumpet, come up here. Many see John going up to heaven as a symbol of the rapture of the church. John was called up to heaven by a voice that sounds like a trumpet, just as the church will be described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 17, where the trump of God, the voice of the archangel, will cry loud and the dead in Christ will rise first. The pattern is significant. Jesus finished speaking and dealing with the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and all the churches are comprehended in the seven. Now, after dealing with the church, Jesus called John up to heaven, catching him away with a voice that sounds like a trumpet. All of this before the great wrath that will be described beginning in Revelations chapter 6. As that great judgment on earth unfold, John, a representative of the church, was in heaven looking down on the earth. Significantly, the word church never occurs in the chapters describing this period of judgment on earth, nowhere in Revelations chapter 4 through 19. Therefore, when we look at this verse, John goes up. How? In the spirit. Immediately, he said, I was in the spirit. Immediately, I was in the spirit. John already said he was in the spirit in Revelations 1 and 10. And let us look at that. Revelations chapter 1 and verse 10. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet. And you and I know now that this trumpet is the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I need you to understand tonight that that trumpet is going to sound and you need to be saved, delivered, and set free from sin and the penalty of death 
and brought into a realm where you will have eternal life. So when the voice of God speaks to us, we will get up and move forward in the things of God. Notice what John said. He said, I was in the spirit. So where was his body? Well, John's body was in heaven also, or he was just in the spirit. This is impossible to know for Paul when he had his heavenly experience, didn't know either. He said he was either in the body or not, according to 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4. John's description of heaven, and I need you to hear me tonight. John's description of heaven is focused on a throne that is in heaven, that is focused on the eternal God, who is the eternal God of life and death the eternal God who moves into all things, both in heaven and on earth. So listen to me tonight and behold a throne. This throne was the first impressed John, and it was the centerpiece of his vision. John was fixed on the occupant that was on the throne, and everything else is described in relationship to the throne. I need you to hear me today. Ah, bless God. And the one that sat on the throne, the throne is not empty. There is someone who sits on this great heavenly throne. The throne is a powerful declaration of not merely God's presence, but also his sovereign rightful reign and his prerogative to judge. And I need you to understand tonight that we can't think rightly about much of anything until we settle in our mind that there is someone who's occupied on the throne in heaven and the God of the Bible rules from that throne. While there are maybe many different interpretations, many fundamental truths and self-evidence, I need you to understand that the throne was occupied and it was occupied by the eternal God. Then verse number three, John saw a heavenly throne and he who sat on the throne was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Now hear me tonight. And he who sat there was light. As John described the occupant of the throne, he did not describe a distinct figure. There is here is no description of the divine being so as to point out any similitudes, any shapes or dimensions. The description rather aims to point out the surrounding glory of the eternal God, and that this is the almighty king who rules heaven and earth. Here we see like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. Listen to me. Instead of describing a specific form or a figure, John emancipates of glistering light of two colors. White, jasper, may mean diamond, and red, sardis. Perhaps these two colors are meant to communicate the glory of the empty tomb, white from Matthew 28, 1 and 3, and sanctification of love of Calvary, red, indicating blood. Or perhaps they are linked with the first and last gems of the high priest's breastplate as found in Exodus 39, 8 through 13. I need you to hear me tonight. Around the setting of all sovereignty, power, and authority and glory, this setting is the throne of the eternal God. God has a reminder of his promise to never destroy the earth again with water. And that promise is the rainbow around the throne of the living God. A throne says, I can do whatever I want because I rule. A promise says, I will fulfill this word to you as I cannot do otherwise. A rainbow around the throne is a remarkable thing showing that God will always limit himself by his own promises. And what was that promise? No more water, but fire next time. Here we find that the theologian trap on the rainbow says, which is a signal and a sign of grace and a covenant of mercy, which is always fresh and green about Christ's throne of grace. And thank God for grace, for by grace we are saved, not a works lest anyone should boast. Here I want you to know the believer glorifies the sovereignty of God because he knows that God's sovereignty is on his side. 
it means that no good purpose of God relating to the believer will ever be left undone. He promised us in the book of John, chapter 14, that if I go away, I'm coming again, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, that in my Father's house are many mansions. And here we are now in the final book, the 66th book of the Holy Bible, finding out that that is exactly what he has done, to go and prepare a place for you and for me. What John saw around the throne was the 24 elders. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. Listen to me tonight. Around the throne were 24 thrones. Before the elders caught John's eye, he noticed that the 24 thrones they sat on that these 24 elders sat on lesser thrones around the main throne for the eternal God. Later, John will mention their song of worship in Revelations 4, 10 through 11. And let me read that to you tonight. Revelations chapter 4, 10 through 11 is the song of the 24 elders. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. This is their song. This is our song, that the eternal God is going to bring restoration, that the eternal God is going to bring a new creation. And I need you to understand tonight that you need to be a part of it. And the only way you can be a part of this new creation is that you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and that you repent of your sins and live now in holiness. I need you to understand tonight that this is a book that is describing the final things that are going to happen in the earth and how God is going to bring everything back into creation, brand new, a new heaven and a new earth. So who are these elders? The elders represent the people of God, especially the Old Testament. The 24 courses of the priesthood represent all the priests, First Chronicles 24, and the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles represent all that is faithful. In Revelations 5, 9 through 10, the 24 elders sang a song of praise to Jesus, and they cried out, for you were slain and have been redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. In that passage, the 24 elders clearly spoke as representatives of all of God's people, great companies of the redeemed. And look how they were clothed, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. The white robes and crowns of the elders seem to indicate that they are indeed human beings and glory, of course, in heaven. Angels are sometimes represented in white robes or garments, according to Mark 16 and 5, John 20 and 12, Acts 1 and 10. But the saints also have white robes, according to Revelation 6 and 11, Revelation 7 and 9, and the chapters 13 through 14. As a picture of their imputed righteousness, Isaiah 61 and 10, Revelations 3, 5 through 18. However, we never see angels crowned, but believers will be. They will be crowned in glory. Therefore, redeemed, glorified man sits enthroned with Jesus on lesser thrones, to be sure, but thrones nonetheless. We are joint heirs with Christ, according to Romans 8 and 17, and we will reign with him, according to 2 Timothy 2 and 12. Listen to me tonight. Impressive and fearful sights at the throne of God. And this is what we need to understand. And from the throne proceeded lightning, thundering, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Hear me tonight. And from the throne proceeded, what did I say? Lightnings, thunderings, and voices. The lightning, thundering, and voices, and fire 
are reminiscences of God's fearful presence on Mount Sinai. According to Exodus 19, 16 through 19, and Exodus 20, 18 through 19, they communicate the awe of associate with the throne of God. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne. The Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God, as referred to in Revelations 1 and 4 and Isaiah 11 and 2, is represented by seven burning lamps. In other passages, he is represented as a dove, according to Matthew 3 and 16, or a flame of fire, according to Acts 2 and 3. The lamps of fire are important because the Holy Spirit is not ordinarily visible. To become visible, he represents himself in a physical form and like a dove or as fire. Listen to me tonight. I need you to understand that this is so important for us to understand that we need the Holy Spirit in our lives to guide, to direct, and to keep us on target as we move forward in the word of the living God. And what was around this throne, according to verse 4 and 6, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. I need you to understand that they're intelligent creatures in heaven who have been made for one purpose, the cherubims, to give God glory day and night. And so here we see now that a sea of glass, which is the sea really made of glass, or did it just look like it? Commentators are divided on this point. For example, Theolog Robinson says appearance, not material. And Alfred says material, not appearance. Whether it looks like glass or is actually made of glass, it is the finest glass like unto a crystal. A sea, this body of water before the throne is reminiscence of the labia in the tabernacle and of washing of the water of the word, according to Ephesians 5 and 26. And according to John 15 and 3, you are cleansed through the words which I have spoken unto you. And so tonight we're being cleansed. So tonight we are being moved now into a special place to look forward to the throne of the living God, who's ruling both heaven and earth. Yes, we know the devil is loose, but he's only loose for a season. And I need you to understand tonight that our God, is in control. Lord have mercy. And so we see now in verses 8, let us read that, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying one thing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Listen to me tonight. I need you to know that in the midst of the throne of the eternal God and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature was the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures each having six wings were full of eyes around and within. So let's hear this. The comparison with Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4 through 14, and Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 20 through 22, we understand these creatures to be cherubims, the spectacular angelic beings surrounding the throne of God. Satan was once one of these high angelic beings, according to Ezekiel 28 and 14, until he fell when he became proud and lifted up and wanted to rule heaven and earth. And so I need you to understand tonight that the cherubims were also prominent in design of the tabernacle in Israel, moving through the wilderness and particularly in the most high place. According to Exodus 25, 17 through 22 and Exodus 26, 1 through 31, the scriptures show us that the tabernacle is a model of the throne of God. In the same manner, Exodus 25, 8 through 9, they were full of eyes front and back, full of eyes around and within. Their multitude of eyes indicate these living creatures, not beasts, as in the King James Version, are not blind instruments or robots. 
they know and understand and have greater insight and perception than any man will ever have. These beings of great intelligence and understanding live their existence to worship and praise the Almighty God. All failure to truly worship is rooted in the lack of seeing and understanding. And if you go back to the book of John chapter 4 verse 24 says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so these cherubims are moving and personified in the worship of the almighty God. And they say, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Let me share something with you tonight. You and I one day will worship and praise him in eternity. And I need you to understand that it's now time for us to do some praising here, giving God praise for what he's done for us in our lives, how he's brought us out of trouble and tribulations and trials and brought us into a solid position to stand on a solid rock. And so tonight in the book of Revelations, in chapter four, we see God moving now as the eternal creator of both heaven and earth and this entire universe. I need you to understand the Bible says one was like a lion, one was like a calf, one had the face of a man like a flying eagle. John describes four cherubims, each with a different face from comparison with Ezekiel chapter 1, 6 through 10. We can see that each of the cherubims have four faces, and at the moment, John saw each one of the four different faces pointed to his direction. The significance of this Four faces have been interpreted in many ways. One, the four faces have been said to represent the elements, the carnal virtue, the faculties and powers of the human soul, the patriarchal churches, the great apostles, the orders of the churchmen, the principal angels, and so forth. But I need you to understand that they also represent the word of the living God, here found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four different faces of the cherubim are often taken as symbols of Jesus as represented in each gospel. Hear me tonight. In the classical church architecture, these four characters are repeated often as a motif that signifies both heaven and the four gospels, which I just gave you, Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John. Because there is no specific connection between the four faces of the cherubim and the, the particular gospel, Different traditions have connected these four faces of the cherubim in different ways. Some have said that Matthew is seen as the lion of the gospel, Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark is seen as the ox of the gospel, showing Jesus as the humble servant, a worker for our salvation. Luke is seen as the man of the gospel, showing Jesus as the perfect man who came as the second Adam, to die for you and for me. John is, is seen as the eagle in the gospel of John, showing that Jesus as the man from heaven the, is from the sky, and he will approach us now and give us the vision of what it is he wants us to see. And so tonight I need you to understand that as we move forward in the things of God, these cherubims are qualified with all necessary endowments, for the discharge of their duties, being bold as lions, painful as ox, prudent as men, delightful and high-flying eagles. And so as well as it is significant for us to see that the Bible associated face with the idea of a person found in 1 Chronicles 12 and 8, 2 Chronicles 29 and 6, Isaiah 3 and 15, 13 and 8. Here we have a singular being with four faces, Apparently, there are beings that can be more than one person, as our God is one God in three. God the Father, God the Word, and God the Holy Ghost, the triune God. Listen to me tonight. John describes what happens at the throne of God. Here we are now in a heavenly atmosphere. Here we are now in the midst of the third heaven. And here's what we hear. John describes in verse 8, he said to this, the four living creatures, each having six wings, 
were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night. Why? Because they have a chant, and that chant is holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They do not rest day or night. Why? They're there to give God glory. They're there to give God praise. They're there to lift up the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they're saying, holy, holy, holy. The cherubims constantly repeat the phrase, holy, holy, holy. God's holy nature and character is declared and emphasized with a three-time repetition. Holy, holy, holy. Lord, have mercy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Then again, I want you to know that they do not rest. They have no rest, and yet they have no unrest neither. The sweet contents that take in their continual employment is fitted to be the believer that it is possible to be in this course, that they are created for just the purpose of this, to give God glory, to give God praise. And I want you to understand the Bible said who was and he is and he is to come. This repeats another idea of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. And let me go there with you tonight. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. And let me read it in your hearing. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Listen to me tonight. We're dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ, who was and who is and who is to come. The one who came down through 40 and two generations that you and I might be brought back to the Father's house. Listen to me tonight. Now we're beginning to see in verse number nine. He said that I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and in the kingdom and patient of Jesus Christ was on the isle called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so tonight we see that this book is about one personality. This book is about one eternal God. And that God is represented as a father, the word and the Holy Ghost. And so tonight we're looking now at verse number nine in chapter four, verse number nine in chapter four. And what do we see? It say tonight, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sit on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 20 and four elders fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. And what do they say? You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. Hmm. And by your will they exist and were created. Listen to me tonight. We are moving now to a place of worship. We're moving now to a place of praise. We're moving now to a place of honor to the most a high God. And now we're seeing the directions of the throne, the throne of the eternal God and the throne of the glorified lamb. Lord have mercy. We're moving now into a place where heaven shows us what God is doing and what God is all about. He's getting ready now to bring judgment on the earth. He's getting ready now to bring evil man to his place and put him now in a place where forever and ever he will be separated from the things of God. And that's why tonight I want you to understand that you need to make up your mind tonight that it is Jesus and him alone. It is Jesus' blood and his blood alone. It is Jesus who has sacrificed for you and for me and for us now to move forward into the things of God because shortly, Things are going to change and you need to have made the right decision based on the word of the living God. Listen to me tonight. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him. The 24 elders worship, which means that all the credit and all the worthiness belong to God. The elders credit God for their own work and reward. And they did this as they cast their crowns before the throne. They recognized that the worth, 
the worthiness belong to God and not to themselves. And so tonight I need you to thank God for giving us life and giving us life more abundantly through his blood that he shed it on Calvary. When we bow down tonight and worship him, we're going to thank him for what he is and what he's going to do for us in the eternity of the future, which we will cover in our next chapter. I need you to understand tonight that the crowns mentioned in Revelation 4 and 10 are the Safado crowns, the crowns of victory, not royalty, but the crowns of victory. These are the crowns of achievement that a winning athlete would receive in the ancient Olympiad Games in Greece. The 24 elders represent all the redeem of God. They, through every achievement rewarded, they are back now giving it to God because they knew and proclaimed that he was worthy to receive glory and honor and power. And I want you to know tonight that he is worthy to receive glory. He is worthy to receive honor. And surely he's worthy to receive power. Listen to what they said. You created all things and your will, they exist and your will, they are created. The 24 elders worshiped God because of his creative power and glory. The fact that God is a creator gives him all the right and every claim over everything, even as the potter has the right and claims over the clay, according to the book of Jeremiah 18 and Romans 9 and 21. I need you to understand that God's right over us as creator is a fact that can be accepted and enjoyed or rejected, leading to frustration. There's a tremendous value in our recognizing that God is the creator and that he rules everything. I need you to understand tonight that you have no power over life. You have no power over death, but the power of life and death is in your tongue through the move of God's word. And so tonight you're going to move forward and live and then be caught up to meet him in the air. And all of these things are going to come shortly. But right now, we're living in a cruel, mean world. We're living in a world filled with war. And we're moving in a world that's filled with death and destruction. But I need you to understand through it all, hold out until the end. For the Bible said in the book of Matthew, that if you endure to the end, you shall be saved. And so I need you to understand that we are moving now into a place where God is having his way. And he's showing us now what it is that he wants us to do. And that is to bring worship and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's done everything for you and for me. He's brought us to a place now of victory. He's brought us to a place now where God is having his way. And so tonight, now we see that in chapter five, briefly tonight, in chapter five, we see the lion and the lamb and the scroll. Lord have mercy. We see now a change of venue from worship now to judgment and judgment because man refuses to obey the word of the living God. And so let me read to you now chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Verse number 2. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals. And verse number 3. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So John said in verse number four, so I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But verse five is a comforting scripture. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold the lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. I need you to understand that all power is in his hand. And when he got up on the third day, he said, all power is in my hands. The keys of death and hell 
are in my hand. And here we see now in verse number six, and I looked, said John, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That's the eternal father. And now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll, to open his seals, for you were slain and have been redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Listen to me today. I need you to understand that if you want to be a part of this new kingdom, uh, if you want to be a part of the new rule of God, then you must do what you need to do before death. For the Bible said that at the point of death, decisions have already been made. And so we see now that there is a powerful move in the heavens. And that powerful move is by the son of the living God, the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Hear me today. Verse number 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them were 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. Verse number 13 of Revelation number 5, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessed and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Verse number 14, then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 20 and four elders fell down and worshiped him who lived forever and ever. I need you to understand tonight that we're moving into a glorious future. Uh, we're moving now into a place where God can move in our lives and show us that he is the God that is in control. Bless God, O oh my soul, and forever know that he is the God that is in our lives to save, to heal, and to deliver. Listen to me tonight as we move now past this chapter five and see now that Jesus Christ, the lamb of the living God is worthy to open every scroll and to bring us now back into the father's will. I need you to understand tonight that this is not a book of mystery, but it is a book that is unfolding to us verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And so here we are now in chapter four and chapter five in the heavenly atmosphere, near the very throne of God, where all power and glory is now represented from him who he is, who was, and who is to come. And I need you to know that every creature is bowing down and saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is and who is to come. Listen to me, he is coming back and he's coming back for a church without a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing. And if you want to be a part of this church, you must now become a part of it right now. Listen to me, don't wait until tomorrow for tomorrow is not promised. For the Bible says to us, work while it is day. For when night cometh, no man can work. And night here typifies death. I need to share with you tonight, as we come to a conclusion, that chapter 4 takes us into the heavenly realm. <laughs> chapter 4 shows us the eternal power of an almighty God. 
Chapter 4 gives us that he's sitting on the throne huh, with all power in his hand, surrounded by angels, surrounded by the four and twenty elders, surrounded by the four creatures, the cherubims, and all of them are saying, holy, holy, holy. And so tonight I need you to understand that chapter 4 brings us into a place where we can see now the third heaven filled with the anointing and power of the eternal God, filled with the power and anointing of the Son of God, sitting on the throne next to his Father. And I need you to know tonight that he's going to come back again. And you need to understand either you're going to be on the side of law and righteousness, or you're going to be on the side of hell and the lake. And so tonight you need to understand that this book about Revelation is about the Lord Jesus Christ. This book of Revelation is about the Lamb of the living God. And so again tonight, let me read to you verse number 8 of chapter 1 of the book of Revelations. This is his own declaration. This is his own declaring. He said, I am the Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And then let me read verse number 11, Revelations chapter 1, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see right in a book, send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Sperna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And so tonight, it has come down to us, the Church of Philadelphia. We're beginning to see now that God has a purpose and God has a plan. And that plan will include you if you move to Calvary and allow the blood of Jesus to move in your wretched life. And when you get into the flow of the blood, he cleanses your sin, past, present, and future. I need you to understand that my past has been forgiven, my present is secure, and my future is irrevocable. In other words, I have now put myself in the word of God. And the word of God, according to John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. This is the God that we're talking about tonight. God the Father, God the Word, and God the Holy Ghost giving us the book of Revelation and telling us now that I'm inviting you into heaven. I'm showing you who I am. I'm showing you what I can do. And then in chapter five, we see the lamb of God that was slain for you and me, opening up the scrolls and now moving us now into a point where judgment is about to take place. And so tonight as I close, I need you to understand that if you don't want to be in judgment, you need to be in righteousness. And in order to be in righteousness, you need to take on the son of the living God, whose name is Jesus. And the Bible said in Matthew 1, 21, and she shall bring forth a son and you shall call him his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And all I need you to do tonight is get back in the word of the living God from the book of Genesis to the book of Malachi classified as the Old Testament, to the book of Matthew, to the book of Revelations classified as the New Testament. 66 books that will bring you into a place where you are now moving into the heavenly realm. And so tonight, I need you to understand that now that we're in the heavens, and now that we've seen the throne of God, now we know who's in control. Now we know who has all power in his hand. You need to understand that the next thing that's going to follow is judgment. And in order for you not to be in judgment, you need to be at Calvary's cross 
at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there that I first saw the light. It was there that I was brought into salvation. It was there that I was given eternal life. And so I need you to understand tonight that this book of Revelation is now for you and for me. God bless you tonight. God keep you tonight. God make his face to shine upon you. This is the apostle L.A. Anderson saying to you tonight in chapters 4 and chapter 5, get ready now for now that we're in the heavenly atmosphere, judgment is on the way and I need you to avoid it at all costs. Get right and do it today. Get right and do it now. In the name of Jesus, I give you his prerogative that he said, I've come that you might be saved and none should be lost. But there's a decision you got to make. And that decision is up to you. Make your decision and make it now so that in the final judgment, you will be on the right side. Hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come on in and enter into righteousness and into a new heaven and a new earth. Otherwise, you're going to hear him say, depart from me. Uh, and then you're going to enter into the lake of fire. So tonight, I want you to understand we're in a heavenly atmosphere. We're in a place of worship. We're in a place now where we're bowing down to the eternal God. And now he's warning us that judgment is on the way. This is the Apostle Ellie Anderson saying to you that are on Facebook Live, go with us now in the next segment on the next week. Call a friend, call a neighbor, and tell them that we're in chapter 6. This is the apostle saying, until I talk to you again, go.